Okay, welcome to the session. Slide into Google for secondary teachers. This is part of what I like to call my nothing but a G Suite thing uh, series of uh, presentations that focuses on uh, the G Suite uh, apps. Uh, and this one here, we're going to be uh, uh, learning how to use Google to foster uh, communication and build a feedback loop for students in uh, secondary education. That's definitely something that um, is, uh, is of huge uh, utmost importance. So <clears throat> the, uh, the link to this slide deck is this bit.ly right here, uh, bit.ly slash slide into Google. The S, the I, and the G are all capitals. Remember, bit.ly's are case sensitive. So again, my name is Adam Waters. I'm a tech integration coach for grade 6 12, 12 for Cutler Arosi Joint Unified School District out here in rural central California. Uh, my district is in Tulare County. Um, from where my, my office is, I could probably get to the Giants Equates in 30 minutes, right in the shadow of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, this is uh, now the end of my 15th year as an educator. Uh, my first 10 years, I was a full-time classroom teacher teaching U.S. and world history for grades 7 and 8. Uh, in 11, 10 and 11, and for the last five years, I've been on, on assignment as a technology integration coach. On the slide here, you have my personal email address. You have my website, techcoachwaters.com, where I house all of my training resources, as well as a link down there to subscribe to my blog, where you can get delivered to your inbox um, a variety of tech tips each week. So what can you expect from this session? So. Um, we're going to talk about how to use Google for two-way communication. Uh, usually people think of Google, they think of searching, but uh, it's a great way for communication amongst teachers and students, and you could even throw parents in there as well. And some of the tools that we're going to be using to do that would be Google Classroom, Google Meet, and Google Chat, which is down right, which is down here. We'll also talk about how to use Google Classroom to collect student work and leave feedback. Feedback is a huge part of that two-way communication. Uh, we'll talk about ways that you can also uh, use Google Classroom uh, in a distance learning environment to actually have students turn in handwritten work, as you see right here, using a mobile app for Google Classroom on an iPhone, an Android, or an iPad, or even a Chromebook if they have access to that. They can, use, they can turn in an image of their work. Um, there's a special uh, function built into the, the apps on those devices that allows them to go ahead and turn in a, an image of written work. So let's go ahead and get started here. We're going to start off here with the basics here with Google Classroom here. So when it comes to two-way communication, Google Classroom is a great way to pretty much send out quick messages to students. So students, you know, the kids nowadays, they are very savvy when it comes to tech, text messages. That's, I mean, not just kids nowadays, but as humans, we are, a lot of us prefer text messages than to other forms of communication. So when you're working with students, you obviously don't want to be giving out cell phone numbers. That's most people don't feel comfortable with that. So the stream in Google Classroom can be like that, sending out announcements, text announcements to your entire class. And uh, if the students have the Google Classroom app on their phone, their tablet, they're gonna get these pop-up notifications very similar to a text message. So <clears throat> that's where we, we take a look at the stream, where you can use a stream. You see this box right here, it says share something with your class. This is where you wanna put announcements to your class, full class announcements. So you simply just click in there and type away. And when you start typing, you can add a variety of things here. You can, besides just text, you can have links to a, some, uh, a file you have saved in your Google Drive, a link to a to a, an article or a, another website you want them to look at, um, any file you have saved on your computer, or even a YouTube video. So it's not just text and the kids will get that message. When you post this uh, announcement in the stream, what's gonna happen is that they, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they will, uh, Oh, I got heartburn. Uh, when you post the announcement in, in, into the st stream, the, every kid automatically gets an email. But let's be honest, kids don't really check their email uh, as much as we would like them or at all for, in, in many cases. Um, but if you have uh, set it up where the kids have the app on their phone, they don't need to check their email um, on their phone or their or their, uh, their tablet. If they have the app, they'll get a pop-up notification, something that kids are much more likely to check rather than just um, having to, to think to go check their email. So something definitely uh, you want to be aware of is using the stream for class announcements. Now, that being said, the stream can be a very cluttered place in Google Classroom. So if you have experience with Google Classroom, you know what I'm talking about because when you post something in the stream, 
it shows up here in the stream and it becomes a very long list. The older posts get pushed down to the bottom. In addition, when you assign when you assign work in classwork, those also get posted in the stream as well. And it becomes a very jumbled mess sometimes. So I'm going to show you something uh, in a second here that's going to show you what it looks like on how to set it up where all of your classwork assignments don't show up in the stream, and the stream is then going to be just for your announcements. So on the student side, this is what it would look like right here. Um, when, when they log into Classroom, the first thing they see at the top here will be that the most recent post. If I'm a student using my, my phone or a tablet and I have the app, then I would have got a pop-up message that would take me right to it. So again, this is the student view of a stream announcement. So how do I set it where my my only my announcements show up in stream and I don't, I don't have to have any of my uh, my uh, assignments being uh, showing up in the stream? Here's how you do it. So if you go to the settings, you click the settings gearbox in the top right corner of Google Classroom, you're going to come down where it says general. And you're gonna, right here where it says classwork on stream, you're going to click the one here that says by default says shows show condensed notification. That means everything's going to get, every post will show up there. So when you click that, you're going to see this little uh, drop down menu right here. And you're going to switch to hide notifications, meaning all of your assignments in, in the classwork tab will not show up in the, in the stream anymore. You click that, you hit save, and then you and then you, go, you go back and any old assignments that you have, that you saw in the stream will actually be eliminated from the stream. They're still in classwork, but they won't be in the stream anymore. And I know a lot of students I've gotten feedback from saying it really helps the students to know that announcements go in the stream um, and then the, we have the, uh, my, my assignments are in classwork. And as a, as a teacher, it, it, it's a lot, easier to manage knowing that, you know, all my uh, <clears throat> my assignments are in one place, my announcements are another. So it kind of keeps them in their own lane. So definitely this is something you may want to revisit and check on uh, the settings for your Google Classrooms. So let's go over just the basics of classwork. We're not gonna go over all the elements of Google Classroom in this session. Um, <clears throat> So again, classwork, as I said right here, it's for posting assignments and activities where students will be submitting work or demonstrations of learning. So if they're not submitting work or demonstrating learning, it, or it's not something that, that goes with that, it's more than likely it should be in the stream. If it's just an announcement, put in the stream. But if it's some kind of activity, it needs to, where they're going to be submitting work, you're, you're going to want to use the class, use classwork. So you click the create button and, oops, create button, and then you're going to get this nice little drop down right here, and all these different a variety of options you have. The most common one you're going to be using right here, and we're going to go over uh, briefly is assignment. This is the one where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. Uh, I could teach you all these in another session. I have other sessions where I teach the rest of these, but we're going to focus here on assignment. <coughs> so this, this is the anatomy of the assignment. When you chose an assignment, it's what it looks like. You have a place for you to put your title. This is uh, this must be. Uh, this is not optional here. Instructions are optional. It's always a good idea to put instructions when you're working with ELs. I use Google Translate religiously. I put them in both English and Spanish. That's a that's a that's a pro tip on my end. Um, besides putting just your assignment, you have your add and create buttons right here. And <clears throat> when you hit the add button, you you can add a file you have in Google Drive. You can add a link that refers to a website or or, or whatever um, <clears throat> to an article. Uh, anything that, that will enhance your lesson. Uh, you have file here. If you have something physically saved on your computer's hard drive, you can attach that to the assignment, or you can drop a YouTube link as well um, as part of your assignment. So <clears throat> what happens here next when you hit create, this is more, um, let, let's say you want to create like maybe a template document for the kids to type um, their essay or maybe an outline. You click Docs right there, it would open it up for you. You create your template, and then the kids will have access to your template. Same thing can be done for slides, sheets, drawings, or if you want to uh, send out a form, you can create it right here. And the beauty of doing this right here, you don't have to save it in your Google Drive. Google Classroom will save it and organize it automatically for you. Uh, that's the beauty of Classroom. Uh, Alice Keeler always says that Google Classroom is the uh, world's greatest filing system. And I, I, I can't think of a better way to characterize Google Classroom. So when you every classroom that, that you create, you, when the first time that you create Google Classroom, you'll see a classroom folder will automatically appear in your Google Drive. And within there, there'll be a folder for each classroom that you create. 
And then within each classroom, you make an assignment. It creates a folder for that automatically. So anytime that you create a doc, you need to create a document for that, that classroom, it's going to save it automatically in there for you. And then when students turn work in, it saves it in there for you. It's, it's, a, it's pretty cool that way. So it does, definitely helps with your organization. So some people like to um, create their stuff beforehand. Others will start the assignment and then choose what kind of uh, file that, that, that they want to attach. And they'll create it right, right here from the assignment in Google Classroom and it files it for you. So it definitely uh, helps you with the organizational piece of it. Over here on the right side toolbar, you, you, can, uh, you can choose to assign this one, um, especially when you're working with secondary, if you teach them uh, multiple periods of the same class, you can, you can assign this assignment to multiple classes. So you click there. In the drop down. you would then choose uh, one, uh, w which classes you want them to uh, this assignment to go to. You assign your point value. You put a due date. It's always a good idea, especially with if you're doing some asynchronous learning and here in a distance environment. And then topic is something I always tell everyone to would definitely recommend you use topics to uh, to organize your classwork. So if you're doing, let's say, a uh, you're a, you're a science teacher in middle school and you're doing a, a unit on uh, parts of a cell. So you may put uh, all your assignments that have to do with that parts of a cell. You'd create the topic parts of a cell and it organizes it within your classwork. It's easy for you to see and for the kids to find. So definitely topic something relatively new to Google Classroom that you definitely want to uh, be aware of. <clears throat> all right, so here, here's uh, what I say is like kind of the bread and butter of Google Classroom. So what happens, um, let's, let's, let's go back in time a little bit. When, when most of us were in school, um, or early earlier in our career before we knew about the awesomeness of Google Classroom. Think of how much time you spent at the copy machine. And you would run copies of some activities or worksheets or whatever, and then you'd have to take time in class to pass them out, or that was a job for a kid. And that took up time in the class getting the paper to the kids. With the uh, classroom, classwork assignment here, you can do that with a click of a button. So let's say that you have this um, this template, this, this article that you want kids to be able to, to read and, and annotate that's in Google Docs. You have it in your drive, or you have, you have an, an essay template that you want them to use before writing their essay. So <clears throat> if you have that in your drive, you can attach it, like we talked about earlier. Anything in your drive can be attached as an attachment to, your, uh, to an assignment in, Google, in uh, Google Classroom. And then what's gonna happen you change the permissions. If you, by default, it's just viewing. The kids can, whatever you, document you send, they can look at it. They can't do anything with it. Or you can do edit, which means everyone's gonna be working on the same document at the same time. That can be chaos. There is a, there is a time and place for that. Or where you're gonna get the most bread and butter is, uh, <clears throat> is gonna be the uh, make a copy for each student. This means that it has made a copy of your template and then pretty much put every kid's name on it and every kid is going to get, get a notification, hey, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so just uh, assigned this to you, and they're going to open it up, and they're going to have this essay template, but their own version of it, your original, will not be messed with at all. And then the kids will then turn in theirs, and there's no, oh, Mr. or Miss, I, I lost my paper. It's in Google Classroom. They, they, they really would have a hard time uh, try, trying to find it. Okay, so, so again, th this is... For beginners to Google Classroom, this is what I would say that this is going to be your bread and butter. This, you, you're going to get the most mileage out of this, uh, this function of Classroom um, in the beginning. So this is kind of what it looks like on the on the teacher end after the kids have started to turn in their work. When you open up the assignment, you're going to then see I've locked out all the names here for privacy reasons. You'll see it on the left side, you know, in this, uh, in alphabetical order, all the students who have turned turned them in, and then if you scroll down, you see the ones who haven't turned it in. And then, so it'll also show it here on the right. So you can click on any of these icons here, and it'll show, um, when I click on it, it's going to show that student's work. <clears throat> Again, it, it live updates to it. If, it. if I'm in the middle of this and a kid turns one in, these numbers will adjust. If a kid turns it in, this will go up to 12. This one would go down to 8. So it's a, it, it does work in real time. So when I, if I were to click on a student, this is going to show me their version. Of, of what they do. This is actually an extra credit uh, assignment I did with memes in a history class not too long ago. And so what, I, what I'm able to do is re review, and this was a Google Slides activity, the slides that they created, and then I could leave comments here. So one of the, um, 
biggest um, parts of this session here is is feedback and communication. So the, the kids that turn in their work, I can leave them comments. I, I can leave feedback. I could say I can maybe it's it's a uh, grammar, it's stylistic, it, it's uh, informational deficiencies that I want them to uh, to fix. So I, I could leave some comments in here. And a lot of times, what I say, please resubmit later for a higher grade. So use my comments to fix it. We want learning to be a process, not just a one and done. They turn it in. They hope they got it right. Um, th this makes it a lot quicker. The second I leave these comments and I click return, they get an email. Or if they have the app on their phone, they're, they're going to get that quick communication. Oh, Mr. So-and-so just um, returned my work. They can, they can cl click on notification, see what comments I left. And then, and, if, uh, the, <clears throat> and then they have a chance now to revise their work. So it's two-way communication here. And Google Classroom, especially if the kids have a mobile app on a phone or an iPad or a tablet, it does make, uh, really speeds up that feedback loop. So next year, we'll talk about uh, Google Meet. So Google Meet is um, one of the newest things here with um, Google. For years, we had Google Hangouts. Uh, Google Hangouts was free um, for people to use to you can, you can start a Google Hangout with somebody and you guys can text back and forth for free anywhere in the world. You can do click on the little um, on that little text conversation and see a camera and you can do a, a video chat. You can bring multiple people into the chat. So Google Meet has now, our Google has now kind of split Hangouts into two separate apps. You have Google Meet is the video conferencing version of it, much like Zoom. And then you have Google, Google Chat, which is just the texting version of it as well. And Google Meet, um, I like to say, is a kind of a watered down version of Zoom. If you know Zoom, then you're probably going to be pretty familiar. It won't take you long to figure out Meet. It doesn't have all the fancy features that Meet, um, that excuse me, that Zoom has, but it pretty much has what you need to conduct a a video conference. It's very quick and easy to schedule. Um, I I like using Meet because it's so quick and easy. It's built into Google. I can I can schedule a meeting right through my calendar. And it's a lot faster and easier to uh, to schedule, but I don't have all the features that Zoom has. Um, kind of my rule of thumb is this: is that um, if you're going to do a large scale meeting with a lot of people or a whole class, use Zoom. If it's going to be just a one on one or a small group, Meet is going to be everything you need, and it's a it's less work in my opinion. But Meet is evolving. Um, in an, right before I started recording this session, um, I was on Facebook where uh, I was reading a post from a, a fellow Google certified trainer named John, one of the best in the world. He's, he's I, I learn from this guy all the time, uh, John Sowash, and he put this graphic showing all the new kind of Zoom like features that Meet, Meet is going to have in the very near future. I would assume a lot of these things like breakout rooms and more controls over uh, muting people's microphones and stuff like that that you take for event you take for granted with with Zoom that Meet doesn't have. Those probably I would assume by the next school year are going to be added to Google Meet. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, Meet is act, is adding new uh, new features all the time. So one of the cool thing is during when the pandemic, when the school closures really uh, started, people were um, there were some a lot of deficiencies both with Zoom and Meet. And Meet, uh, what they've done here, there's a lot of issues with kids kind of. Uh, joining Google Meet and staying afterwards and messing around with their friends when the teacher was gone. Google has done a good job of, of making sure that doesn't happen anymore. And they've built Google Meet into Google Classroom. So this is the teacher view you see right here. And it says right here, Meet Link. And as long as you see this little camera, this means that it's turned on. So <clears throat> if, I tr if I have it turned on in my settings, so you click on the settings gearbox and you go to Meet, you, tr you just turn the switch on. If I turn the switch on, the kids can then see this, and then maybe I, I put an announcement, so like it says right here, video call to today at 10 a.m. So for me, my rule of thumb, five minutes before at 9:55 a.m. on the day that we have um, that we have a uh, <clears throat> a video call, uh, we're gonna do a lesson. Uh, <clears throat> for uh, for example, there, um, five minutes early, I will come turn this on, and then I will be the first one in the room. And then as kids start joining, um, I'm kind of uh, moderating already and uh, kind of uh, getting kids re ready to get started. When when I'm done, when, when I go back to my settings and I click this, I turn it off, on the kids won't see this anymore. The, 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 they'll see like a, a little link button with a line through it on your end. 
Um, the teacher will be able to see it, but there'll, there'll be a, a link button with a line through it. And what, what that'll do is means that, that that means that the kids won't be able to see this. They only see it when you turn it on. So when you turn it off, it kicks every kid out. So kids can't stick around and do inappropriate things while you're not there. So th that's the beauty of it. In addition, the, the real cool thing about this with Google Meet here built in the classroom, a kid could take this link and send it to a friend or a stranger. And guess what? They can't join. Th they could click on it and they think they're in, but they're just going to be in a blank room with no nobody there. The only people who actually can join the real, who can join the real um, Google Meet video conference, you have to be enrolled where it says people right here. You have to be one of the kids or one of the co-teachers that are in that classroom. They're the only ones who can join it. So no outsiders. There's going to be no Zoom bombers. The only Zoom bombers would be the could uh, the only Zoom bombers potentially could be the ones in your class who are who are acting uh, inappropriate. But then you're at the same time you're able to to kick them out as well. But that being said, you don't want to need to worry about you know someone stranger from the public coming in to your, to your Google Meet video conference. It, they have to be enrolled in your Google Classroom. And again, this is great for that two-way communication between you and your students back and forth. Um, you, <clears throat> you could do it like this when you uh, set up a, a, an announcement. Maybe the announcement isn't for every, every student. Maybe it's for maybe a group of kids. When you create this, you create the uh, announcement. Let me go back a little bit here. When I create it here, it says all students. When if I were to click that, I can uncheck all the students and only check mark the kids that I want to be in my uh, that I want the announcement to be for. So when I post it, only those kids get the announcement. That that that, that kind of uh, gives you um, another way to kind of customize your communication only with certain students. So maybe I'm going to tell them to at uh, 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 4 p.m. Um, uh, go into Google Classroom and click the Meet link, and we'll we'll have a small group. Um, so, uh, session, a little study session. So again, just another option here. Again, these are all ideas for you to improve your two-way communication using Google. So let's talk a little bit here about Google Chat. So Google Chat, um, again, is the uh, is one of the next incarnations of Google Hangouts. It's the texting incarnation of Hangouts. And for years, you've probably seen that you've had this little Google Hangouts in your uh, little uh, area in your in your Gmail, and it's still there now. But in the last month, it has now been split. You see Google Meet and Google Chat. They've split it into two separate apps. So if you just want to start a, a video call, you click that, and then you start inviting people. But if you uh, texting is a is a very good way to have kids you, to communicate with your kids. It's something that kids are familiar with. They're good at it. They're comfortable with it, and the same way that you were able to text people with Google Hangouts uh, through Gmail here on the bottom left of your uh, of your of your of your Gmail window, um, Google Chat it works the exact same way. So when I click on any of these conversations here, it'll pop up on the right, and I have a little chat a little chat window where I can chat away with uh, with with uh, my students or colleagues as well. So if I want to start a new one, I would click the plus button. I would then type in their name. And then I would uh, then start a chat uh, with, with that person. Um, and when you're working with students within the same domain, all you need to do is type their name, and eventually it'll populate right here, and you just select it, and you can start chatting away. Um, in some domains, it has it where you can't just chat with anybody. The first time you chat with someone, it may say send an invite because it doesn't want uh, a lot of uh, domains have that set up because they don't want people just automatically, you know, one kid is trying to chat with another kid, then, then they could be bullying each other or, you know, harassing some, some random stranger. So it will say send an invite, and they have to accept the invite before you can start you can start chatting. So, but this is a great little back channel you can have with students. Again, th this app is free on their, on their phones or their tablets. And um, it's, again, you don't need to give out your, you don't need to set up remind.com. You don't need to give out your, your phone number and text with students. You can do it right here through Google for free. If they have the app, they're going to get these pop-up notifications the same way they would get a text message. So again, we have that familiarity um, with um, different, um, uh, with this form of communication. So Gmail is probably the easiest way to access uh, Google Chat. That's the way I always use it. Um, you don't have to use Gmail to uh, access Google Chat. You can do the web-based version by simply going to chat.google.com. You can also find it in your waffle as well. 
So the waffles, those those nine little square dots, that's what they actually call it the waffle. I'm not, I'm not making that up. So you have the web base. This is the um, this is the uh, kind of what the new Google Chat looks like. You can still, as of right now, use the old Google Hangouts. So if you went to hangouts.google.com, it would look and function almost the same way. The only difference here between Chat and Hangouts, Hangouts still allows you to, to do video calls. Chat is uh, completely text right now. So the same way here, like you did, like we did here, where I would then type someone's name, type in their name, and you would then click on it and start start a uh, start a uh, chatting message with um, those people. So again, long story short, um, this is uh, not a way that I, I I don't even recommend going to the the Google Chat uh, uh, website. Um, it's a lot more it's a lot more convenient just to find them. I'm in Gmail all the time. That's where I spend a lot of my time uh, for my job. So it, it's good to have it all in one place. So I tend to use it more in ch uh, chat within Gmail than through the actual chat website. So <clears throat> when it comes to distance learning um, in Google, a lot of people think, hey, everything's got to be digital. Um, I beg to differ because you can still – Google has given us the opportunity to still use Google Classroom and have kids do handwritten work. Whether For me, I'm big on, on having kids do sketch notes. That's my, that's my preferred method of, of having kids take notes is through sketch notes and having them turn it in. Um, how do we do that in a distance learning environment? Google Classroom, the apps have, it, have us taken care of. Right here, we have what, what the Android app looks like. Here's some screenshots. Um, that I've taken from my from my actual Android phone, and the the iPhone version looks very similar. It's not much difference. The functionalities are the same. They might be look a little slightly different. The format, but the, for the most part, what you see here is what you're going to get, whether you're on an iPhone, an iPad, or an Android. So, as a student, when they open up their their assignment here, they would click right here, add attachment. And let's say their attachment was to to draw a picture, to do a sketch note, or you know do some hand. You want to do something something handwritten. They click add attachment, and then when they click that, they they get this nice menu here of their options to attach something to this assignment. So they can if they already have they've done the handwritten work, they have their paper in front of them. They click take photo, and all of a sudden their camera's going to pop up, and they would just click the little button to snap it. And the second that it snaps, it automatically attaches it right here. In this case, this was a JPEG, and they uh, they added it right here to the uh, to the assignment. And then I simply would with my finger, I would then swipe up, and then I would click right here, turn in, and just like that, using the the app itself allows you to uh, take a picture of your work. You don't have to go take a picture of your work, and then um, yeah, I mean, tell you could take a picture of your work beforehand, then open it up, and then they have to click file and find the find that picture file within their within their um, within their phone's uh, file system and then attach it they could do that that's just a lot more steps the take photo it expedites the process tremendously so I have a, a few videos here um, that I'll, that show you how to do um, do a turn in um, handwritten work whether it's on an iPhone iPhone or iPad an Android which you saw in the screenshots or if they actually do have access to a Chromebook um, this is uh, three different ways they can do this. So these are all videos that I've made over the last few months that you can definitely share with students and say, here, if you, uh, when we do this handwritten assignment, why don't you turn into Google Classroom, um, just copy what the guy in the video does. You can share it with them. This is, this is, it's on YouTube. Um, it's public. So feel, feel, feel free to use these videos for yourself and your students. So normally, <clears throat> what we would do right now, we would jump into an, an activity here called Thin Slides. Thin Slides is one of the uh, one of the edu from uh, activities from the Edu Protocols uh, Field Guide Volume One, written by my my good friends John Cripple and Marlena Hebron. And Thin Slides um, might be my favorite Edu Protocol because it's so quick and easy. It gets kids listening and speaking and learning from each other, and it doesn't take it takes little to no tech skills. If you if you know how to make a Google slide and you know how to type and and, and create a bunch of slides really quickly by pushing Control M, then you, then you have it. Um, so pretty much thin slides is like this. What what, what you're gonna do? You're, you're gonna create your slide deck, and you're gonna assign one slide per per student, and you distribute it through Google Classroom, giving the students edit permission. So they're all gonna work on the same slide deck. So again, 
early on, that there's going to be some bumps on the road. I'm not going to lie. There's some kids who are get on the wrong slide by accident or on purpose, and they, they start typing on somebody else's slide. You know, there's going to be some growing pains. Um, but definitely it does work. It gets better. And, and I got to the point using thin slides weekly where kids – could do it without even thinking about it. And those problems where kids being on the wrong side, either on purpose or by accident, those kind of just, just went away. So, but again, early on, make it, make it an expectation. Be very blunt about it. Stay on your slide. Now, and one of the things that I do to make sure they stay on their slide, um, I could just say, okay, everyone gets a number and that's your slide. I've taken the time to make a template for, for thin slides where I actually took the time to put each kid's name on a slide. I say, go find find your name. It's in alphabetical order. And they that makes it a lot easier, especially with younger kids. It, I would definitely um, definitely um, recommend making a template with kids' names on it, and then you can make a copy of that, of that thin slide uh, template each time for different activities. So the way it works is like this. You're going to give on that title slide that gives them a prompt or a big idea that you want them to think about, reflect about. Um, then you want, then once they're on their slide, you say, okay, you have three minutes. That's all they get. Three minutes to build their slide. And their slide, all they have to put, only one word and one image. They have three minutes. So let's say, for example, they're learning about the Revolutionary War. We'll, we'll give them a broad topic there. Revolutionary War, one word and one image. So they're going to think of something that they've learned or that resonates with them about the Revolutionary War. So maybe a student puts, <clears throat> they put a picture of the Boston Tea Party, and maybe they have a, a picture of, <clears throat> they put a picture of, uh, of the, uh, the picture of the Boston Tea Party, and, and maybe Boston Tea Party is their, is their, is their one word. A Boston Tea Party gets three words, but it's it's a title, so we're gonna call it one word. Let's say that that's what the, what they what they think about when they think of the Revolutionary War. So in three minutes, they have to put a picture and that word. And what what that's gonna what that does that one picture and one word, it's gonna jog their memory. That so while they're waiting for their turn when it comes to present, they're thinking that one word and one picture that's gonna jog my memory and remind me of what I'm gonna say. So what's gonna happen once once three minutes is up, then you're gonna project the slides. And every kid's gonna see. You can do that live in person with students when we're able to do that again, or if you're doing on Zoom or Google Meet, you share your screen and when each kid's um, slide pops up, it's their turn to present. But their presentation is a, what I call a five to seven second micro presentation. That's it. Five, seven seconds max. A lot of times kids are like, oh, I don't want to stand up and, and, and talk in front of the class because, you know, it's embarrassing when staring at me. But if I tell them, can you do it for five to seven seconds? Oh, yeah, I, I can do that. Th th that's not too hard. That doesn't seem very scary. All I have to do is talk about my one word and one picture for five seconds. Oh, that's easy. I got this. So a lot of kids who may be afraid to speak out now feel more confident in doing that. This is huge for English learners. So they do their, their five to seven uh, micro presentation as soon as they're done. And if they're live, right, they sit down. If you are doing it through Zoom or through Google Meet, then you know once they if they're paying attention, once they see their slide pop up, then they're gonna go ahead and speak for their five to seven seconds. So it's a great way to get every kid presenting, speaking, and listening. And, you, and a lot of times when I facilitate this, I may do some banter with the kids and provide some commentary, and I'm doing some of that communication with them back and forth between uh, teachers and students. Um, so a possible extension, you know, time time permitting uh, in, with uh, thin slides that I've done in the past is that after we've gone through it, maybe, so a lot of times I'll tell kids to have maybe a sticky note or a piece of paper and write down things that get said often. And just to kind of take some notes on there to see what those trends are. Um, I also tell kids that, okay, when we're done, we're going we're gonna to go to Google Classroom stream and I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'll post something in the stream and then they have to comment with what's what, with what they said. So what they said verbally, now they're going to type it. And then they have to go back and look at each other's posts and they have to choose one that was different from theirs. And they have to paraphrase it and repost but paraphrasing. So you're going to get kids looking at different ideas, putting things in their own words, and really working with that language. That is just a, uh, just a, just a possible extension you may want to consider when doing thin slides. So again, some thin slides tips, like I say, if possible, take the time to put kids' names on the slide. That does help with the management of it. It's a little tedious, but once you do it, you're going to be glad that you did. Um, when you are... Um, <clears throat> 
when you're doing this with Zoom or Google Meet, um, doing thin slides, um, it might be a good idea to take the link to the slide, make sure that you set the permissions to be that edit permissions and put the link in into the chat of either Zoom or Google Meet. If you do that, then um, they don't have to be going uh, switching uh, tabs and windows, trying to find Google Classroom and joining in. It, it in, in distance learning, if you can just put that into the chat, the kids just click on it. It takes it right to it. Um, and then uh, have kids when you start the thin slides, you want to have them um, first again mute when they're not talking, but when it's their turn, they they, they mute and then unmute. Uh, they unmute and then they mute when they're done. So just a couple of things to think about uh, when doing thin slides in a distance learning environment. Okay, so again, my, my name is Adam Waters. I'm a tech integration coach from Cutler Rosie Joint Unified School District. I want to thank you guys for hanging out and learning with me um, on this Friday afternoon here in June. And again, with me, you have a session with me, you have free tech support for life. So feel free to reach out to me through email, through my website or my blog. And I um, actually, Twitter might be the fastest and easiest way to get a hold of me. So you can find me on Twitter at Tech Coach Waters. Follow me, I'll follow you back. I want to grow that, grow my network with all these great educators. And I, I make it a point to respond to any tweets or messages or emails uh, within 24 hours. So thanks again, and I hope I will see you guys down the road.